Okay, good morning, all of you. Uh, we have already discussed something about acute inflammation, and you know what it is. We'll look a little bit more at the details of the mediators which produce inflammation because they tend to be quite important. So, what are the chemical mediators? These are messengers which will act on the components of inflammation. What are the components of inflammation? Components are blood vessel reactions, yeah, plasma protein exudation, or increased vascular permeability. So, there are only two or three things which can there. You know, vasodilatation, increased vascular permeability, chemotaxis, migration, and coming out of neutrophils. They all require mediators. So, there are certain general properties of these. These are typically derived from cells are plasma protein and remain as inactive precursors. We don't want the body to be inflamed all the time. Right. And typically these inactive precursors are activated by proteolytic cleavage, the best example of which is complement. There is also an amplification, means that a little bit of the mediator is generated, the subsequent mediators get more in quantity and so the reaction gets amplified and that's why it's called a cascade reaction cascade means one following the other and each step of the cascade amplifies the response but on the other hand these tend to have very short t halves so they are short lived decay fast either they are washed away or there are in uh, proteins and inhibitors which prevent their action and they end up forming very extensive network of interacting chemicals. It's literally impossible for anybody to remember all of this, but some important things we have to remember. So how short is short? It can be as little as seconds to minutes, but some of them last for hours. So as you can understand, if you want an inflammation to be more sustained, then you want it to be present for a longer time period. As I said, they are activated when they are required, but when they are required, they are required in an urgency. You want it right now. There is no time for it to be synthesized for a few hours and then it will come. Too late for that. So, they are always kept ready. Either you keep it in an inactive form or you keep it sequestered. So, it is active form, but it is limited by the membrane. Others are produced when required and these can also be quite fast. That means uh, this is similar to an inactive form. So, arachidonic acid metabolites are the typical example. The other is slower. Yeah, somebody said something. The other is synthesis. Nuclear synthesis takes a few hours. So, it is not very fast. So, different types of inflammatory mediators. We have discussed some of them, but the most important are those which are derived from the cells, that is the neutrophil, and those coming from the liver. So, from the liver, you typically get the clotting factors and the complement. So, these are extremely important in inflammation. The other are derived from the local site where the cells, neutrophils have come out and they degranulate. So, typically, Mediators which are sequestered are like histamine, serotonin, lysosomal enzymes or instantly synthesized are the prostaglandins and leukotrienes. So, if you look at what all you need to remember, you need to learn about the vasoactive amines, they are important. You need to know the plasma proteins, the complement, kinin and clotting system. You have probably already done them in biochemistry. You need to know about arachidonic acid metabolites because A, they are very important and B, this is one of the most commonly um, altered using drugs when we are trying to treat inflammation. Cytokines are important because uh, they are extremely potent and important. And similar to cytokines, we have inflammatory cytokines which are called chemokines. So, we will look at all of these. Some others are also important like platelet activity factor, nitric oxide, lysosomal constituents, free radicals and neuropeptides. So all of these regardless, so there is a long list and each of those has other subclasses, but all of them have a receptor ligand interaction mostly. Some have direct enzymatic activity and certain things are just going to cause damage. So they do not have subsequent downstream regulation. 
they just cause damage. So most important of these are the vasoactive amines. Vasoactive amines are the histamine and serotonin. They are kept in these muscles, vasophils, and platelets. They kept sequestered and ready for action. So when okay, let's try to understand when will the plat platelets degranulate? When will a mass cell degranulate? Try to think. So yesterday we did what sets off inflammation. Anything which stimulates mass cell. It could be physical, it could be chemical, or it could be another mediator which goes and binds to mass cell. Platelets. So the platelets which are circulating in your body, they are not going to degranulate. whenever they are activated. So platelets activate and aggregate in response to other mediators. But one of the most important way of activation is when they come out. So they come out when there is a breach in the continuity of the blood vessel or when they stick to endothelial injury. So this is what mast cells will look like if you stain it with uh, tolidine blue. They will have a metachromatic granule and that's why it is easy to pick them up. And the main Vasoactive amine is histamine. So these are either synthesized from histidine, that is histamine, or tryptophan, which is serotonin. You must have already done. Now both of these can also act similar to neurotransmitters, and uh, you must have done it in your neurotransmitters, just like. At the end of a nerve, they come out as a neurotransmitter. From the mast cell, they just come out into the tissue. They do their function in the tissue itself. So all of these can set off a mast cell release. We saw that trauma, cold, heat can set it off. Whenever an IgE binds to mast cells, now anybody has read why an IgE might bind to mast cell? Somebody is telling, but I'm not able to hear. Excellent, but uh, why IgE? So IgE is commonly what is generated when you have an allergy to something. You are exposed to an allergen, it generates IgE. That IgE goes and binds to the mast cell by the constant portion as you rightly pointed out. Having bound to it, it is easily set off when it recognizes the same antigen again. So if you come in contact with the allergen, Immediately you will have an inflammatory response. So what is the components of inflammation? Your nose will get red, your secretions will increase because there is congested, congestion, it will swell up because there is edema and the cells, uh, vascular junctions become leaky and things come out. And so you have a big red swollen nose. That's what happens in an allergy and that's why these immune reactions can set off the mast cells. Now C3 that is complement can also set them off. And when will C3A and C5A come out? Complement needs to be activated. What is the most important cause for it to be activated? If when it comes out, that means instead of being in the blood, if it comes out, it will typically get activated at the local site. Of so what it will do is it will potentiate the inflammation. So the mast cell degranulated, brought C3A and C5A, it simulated more and so the inflammation went on for a longer time. Otherwise the vasoactive amines would have been washed away. So other things like interleukins can also do the same. Serotonin is not that important in humans but is present in platelets. And is more important in rat models, which are extremely important because that's one of the organisms we use for studying various processes. Typically, they are released when there is platelet aggregation and release, which happens in thrombosis, which is an essential component of inflammation. What happens in inflammation? Blood vessels leak, thrombo, uh, thrombin gets, I mean, the clotting mechanism gets activated in the extracellular tissue because of the factor, and you get a clot. And that thrombin will again cause platelet aggregation and more release of serotonin. 
So what do they do? They cause vasodilatation. We already saw in the triple response, and they increase increase uh, vascular permeability, mainly by endothelial contraction and gap formation. But histamine has multiple receptors. The two most important are the H1 and the H2. H1 receptors mediate the inflammatory effects. So which antihistaminic would work? If you want to give. Has anybody ever taken an antihistaminic when you had a cold or allergy? Cetrazine or somebody said Allegra, I think. So these are typically H1 blockers. So there are multiple types of blockers which have different um, intermediate messengers which mediate their action. And H1 receptors mostly cause smooth muscle contraction, as in bronchoconstriction. And increase vascular permeability, vasodilatation. H2 is more important for gastric secretion, and H3 is more important in some CNS. So, what's a neuropeptide? Neuropeptides are substance P and neurokinin. These are secreted by the nerves themselves. So, you have nerve endings in the body. When there is inflammation, these nerve endings give away some amount of substance P. And that substance P in turn will stimulate other nerve, pain nerves, causing sensory perception of pain. Next, we come to the plasma proteases. These are the complement system, the kinin system, and the clotting system. Okay, so all of these are interlinked together. Each one of them has one thing or the other which activates the other. So the purpose of this lecture is not to give you the cascade because you can read that from your books or you must have memorized it already from your book. The purpose of it, the lecture is just to make you understand what is going on. So what happens? Complement is a set of 20 proteins which include the cleavage products which are in the plasma and are inactive. Generated from where complement comes from? Clever. So they arrive in inflammation because there is increased vascular permeability because of histamine. So histamine sets it off. And typically their cleavage products are called A and B. So in history they have switched A and B couple of times. Okay, so I will tell you the names which is in, known in common parlance. You can check whether it is still active or not active. Yes, please. So see, the A is the one which is typically released and diffuses into the surrounding and B is for the bind which remains bound. Okay, so they have switched it around because they wanted to make one as the shorter and one as the longer. But uh, you can check the books what is the latest way that they are being named. So there are three ways in which you can activate complement. You must have already done this, the classical pathway, alternate pathway and lectin pathway. Classical pathway, antibodies, means IgG. Alternate pathway, lipopolysaccharide. Lectin pathway is lectin, lectin is just sugar on the microbes. So all of them activate complement and complement, they all do what is known as C3 conversion. Central to that is C3 getting converted into C3, A and B. So both the classic and alternate pathway end up in cleaving C3 and releasing two main mediators. One is C3A and C5A. These are the flow, these are flowing away. They are called the anaphylatoxins and they produce inflammation and chemotaxis. That means they cause vasodilatation, they cause increased vascular permeability, and they attract cells. So everything which you need to do because of uh, requirement of inflammation, C3A and C5A can do. Whereas C3B and C5B are more of doing specific functions. So antigen opsonization is what C3B does. So what's an opsonin? We discussed it a little bit yesterday. Makes more tasty, but tasty for what? Which, how will it, what is its tongue? Which, which receptor? Which complement receptor? 
हाँ सी थ्री बी रिसेप्ट है ना सो सी थ्री बी रिसेप्ट है सो एफ सी एंड सी थ्री बी विदाउट थिंकिंग इफ यू टेल एनी वेयर इट विल टर्न आउट टू बी राइट दिस आर द टू मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट रिसेप्ट मैक्रोफाजेस एंड एंडोथिलियम ओके सो सी थ्री बी एंड सी फाइव बी आर ऑप्शन and c5 gets bound to the membrane this why is called b and once it binds to the membrane it subsequently aggregates the 6 7 8 and 9 which aggregate together to form a large molecular complex called the membrane attack complex they lies the cell now which cell would that be not really you can but that's bacteria usually covered by cell wall so this membrane attack complex is most important when you are lysing rbcs so when an immunoglobulin or a complement binds to an rbc it will lyse that rbc so typically found in things like a transfusion reaction where if you get you know abnormal rbcs which are recognized as foreign by the human body they will be attacked and lysed so the most important place where membrane attack complex happens is there but it can as you point out occur in any other area where some bacteria is there which doesn't have or which has a thin cell wall or which doesn't have a cell wall or other cells so anything recognized as alien and a membrane will be lysed by forming pores into it so we have already seen this is the main thing which happens c3 conversion by these three methods now what is the classical pathway it is when an antigen antibody complex binds to something typically the cell membrane cell membrane is that which has some foreign antigen on it so it binds antibody is bound and so complexin gets activated goes there forms a hole and the cell dies alternate pathway cell membrane of a bacterium typically so properdin activates the factor and then it lyses that membrane also then we have the lectin binding pathway which is again binding to mannose residues of the bacterial cell wall so usually what this will do is make it more tasty so macrophages will eat it so mannose direct recognition is also possible or c5b or c3b may bind to it and make it more easy to recognize so each of these there is an amplification So C5B binds to cell membrane of bacteria or human cells, and then lyses it as a membrane attack complex. So this is a more graphic representation to show you that this uh, the last thing which gets formed C5B9 is one of the large protein assemblies. So throughout your uh, biology in cell biology, you are going to come across these large assemblies: apoptosome, inflammasome. you know ripoptosome membrane attack complex all of these are large assemblies which subserve a function okay and uh, you would do well to study up on this because these are like nano motors or nano particles they are the same size and it might be possible that uh, humans might engineer such products which act outside of the cell or elsewhere also so these molecular assemblies are uh, central to the clotting mechanism also because just like complement occurs where it is bound to the membrane the clotting factor is also binds to the membrane and it is activated on the surface of the membrane it doesn't get activated everywhere so anaphylatoxins all the functions of inflammation opsonin there is another particle called c3d which uh, recognizes this pathogen associated molecular patterns and access an opsin in what are the effects of anaphylatoxins everything that means vasodilatation increased vascular permeability hemotactic for neutrophils more mast cell and basophil degranulation bronchoconstriction that is asthma and then cell priming that means enhancing the functions of neutrophils increasing the c3 receptor expression by the neutrophils and macrophages neutrophils getting degranulated 
and super oxide production by neutrophils. All of this is supported by the inflammatory effects of anaphylatoxin TA and C5A. So bacterial killing is by inflammation itself. How will inflammation kill the bacterium? Exactly. Neutrophils will come and they will deliver some lysosomes which act like, you know, carpet bombing of the area and get rid of the bacterium or directly killing it by membrane attack or making it easy to be eaten by making it possible to phagocytose it. So, this is a list of all the things which are uh, important in uh, complement. It is taken from your Robbins. See it there. Now, it is important to know that if something is so important, there has to be a regulation for it. So, you have the most important factor as a spontaneous decay of activated factors. They do not stay long as active and they get washed away also. So, wash away means they are insufficient concentration to act anymore. Then you have cleaving inhibitors which cleave, for example, factor I cleaves TB. Then we have binding inhibitors of which the most important is the C1 esterase inhibitor. And then there is membrane protection mechanism. So we have things like decay acceleration factor which breaks down the C3B. Okay, and we have things like protecting or CD59. These if a membrane is attaching complement, they protect the complement, protect the membrane from the complement. So, these are extremely rare, but they are what made us understand complement when we studied them. So, you have certain complement deficiencies. So, you can broadly divide them into the early, the middle and the late. And you can also divide it into congenitally absent complement or acquired deficiency. Acquired most important is consumption. So there are certain conditions like kidney diseases where there is constant activation of the complement. Constantly activated, they are consumed and their levels get low in the plasma. You will be doing tests for this all the time. Typically seen also in autoimmune diseases. The congenital are divided into early, middle and late. So, if there is an early type of um, complement deficiency, you get something resembling an autoimmune disease, something resembling something called systemic lupus erythematosus. So, an autoimmune disease we will study later on. Okay, so patient will present with symptoms of SLE. If you have middle type of complement deficiency, that means that they are not producing sufficient inflammation or you know chemotaxis and opsonization. So, you get pyogenic bacterial infections, you get abscesses. If you have late complement deficiency, that means the membrane attack complex is not there. And you typically get bacterial infections by Neisseria species. So, Neisseria, you have done Neisseria in your microbiology? If not, you will. And these are specialized infections. So, you can see that the membrane attack complex is not that important. Only few organisms are killed by this. Yeah. Okay, so what happens? Okay, let us look at it. I think there is a subsequent site. I'll be coming to this. So what happens when there is a deficiency? Uh, if this is a better slide. So, here we have what happens in the classical pathway deficiency. If there is a predisposition to SLE type symptoms, it is because there is deficiency in, results in an increased precipitation in certain situations. Okay? So, immune complexes require to float in the blood to be uh, carried away. If they are not floating away because some of the complement uh, components are deficient, there is excessive deposition of complement containing, uh, you know, immune complex. Immune complexes, IgG and other components of complement. 
so they don't get carried away so they get deposited in various parts and so the features start resembling an immune complex deposition disease so called type 3 hypersensitivity reaction and so the features resemble those where there is excessive production of immune complexes so here the production of immune complex is normal but because of some components not being all right they are not carried away okay so these are pretty rare it's not so important for you to uh, know this except with this c1 deficiency causes hereditary angioedema so hereditary angioedema means that patient presents with edema and laryngeal edema difficulty in breathing and uh, various areas of uh, you know swelling in the body and this kind of angioedema can be quite life threatening and it is because there is too much activation of so the inhibitor is gone, so the complement is not dampened and so you get too much activity of the anaphylatoxin. So there is too much vasodilatation and increased vascular permeability. That's the only one which are which is clinically likely that you might see. The others are very rare and uh, typically seen you know case reports. Now we come to the kinins. You know about the kinins? Radikinin, calicrine, precalicrine, you must have done it in your biochemistry. They are intricately linked to the clotting factor activation. So when Hegeman factor is activated, it also activates the precalicrine activator which converts plasma precalicrine to calicrine. So calicrine is also chemotactic but more importantly it converts high molecular weight kininogen to bradykinin. And bradykinin is an important inflammatory mediator. Were you the same person who came at 8.30 yesterday or you are a different person? You are a different Who was the one who came at 8.30 yesterday? She still not come. We are still waiting for her. So, uh, activation of calicrine requires negative charge of the surface. So typically phospholipids with negative charge are required and usually collagen, basement membrane, they are exposed, activate the Hageman factor which then activates the precalicate. This is just to show you that these two are intricately linked. Yes, please come in. So what are the important functions is all you need to remember, everything. So you can say everything of anaphylatoxin with one extra which is pain, pain is also there with bradykine. So bronchoconstriction is again important because that's an important disease, asthma is an important disease. This shows you the intricate interplay of the complement, the fibrinolytic, the kinin cascade, the clotting cascade, everything is linked to each other. One can activate something else in some other of the branches and so this results in amplification. So the most important things which get amplified are the calicrine and the plasmid. These two mostly get more amplified than others. So Intrinsic factor, I mean, um, not in, intrinsic pathway is because of Hageman factor activation. Extrinsic because of exposure to thromboplasting. End result, conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. And thrombin is a mediator of inflammation. Thrombin causes platelet aggregation, endothelial cell activation and contraction of vascular smooth muscle cells. So, how does thrombin work? Mostly by P-selectin mobilization. Who remembers what is P-selectin? P4 and P4 palate. What is palate? Vibel palate body. So, in endothelial cells. Then the second important is chemokines. Third is integrin expression by endothelial cells. So, essentially it is activating the endothelial cells. Then COX-2 and prostaglandin uh, production. So almost 
many of the cellular functions of inflammation you can say the previous mediators which we studied were mostly affecting the vascular functions of inflammation are affecting the cellular function endothelial function and activation the fibrinolytic system also is important because plasminogen to plasmin plasmin cleaves fibrin and causes fdp production fibrin degradation products which can increase the vascular permeability plasmin can cleave complement and plasmin can activate hegemon factor so three of the most important uh, functions it can so we have looked at one set of mediators that are the plasma proteins synthesized from liver let's move to another way that you generate these mediators which is the newly synthesized arachidonic acid metabolites so there are now four pathways which are described but i will talk about three of them they are derived from cell membrane phospholipid by phospholipase so arachidonic acid gets converted by cyclooxygenase to prostaglandins so when you say prostaglandin without specifying you mean prostaglandin e and f2 alpha because so these are the two important prostaglandins by different enzymes you can also get prostacyclin which is prostacyclin synthase or thromboxin a2 which is thromboxin a2 synthase so these are different so what does this group do almost everything related to inflammation prostas so thromboxin a2 you can remember is the naughty naughty child it causes all the bad things like vasoconstriction bronchoconstriction platelet aggregation and pgi2 is the teacher who prevents all this by causing opposite of that vasodilatation and inhibit platelet aggregation if you come to this pathway which is a lipoxygenase pathway there are two main things which can get produced one are the leukotrienes and others are the lipoxins important mediators are leukotrienes and you can broadly divide them into b4 hemotactic and c4 d4 e4 so in the old days when i was much younger we i used to remember this as huey louie and dewey but i think uh, present generation may not know who they are they come in donald duck so they are like that they are the naughty ones okay c4 d4 and e4 they cause whatever bad things you can think of for asthma bronchoconstriction vasoconstriction bronchospasm increased vascular permeability so these are the bad kids for just like thromboxane and leukotriene c4 d4 e4 leukotriene b4 is more of a chemotactic agent so two kinds of cyclooxygenase are there one is cox1 which is constitutive and cox2 which is inducible you already know them so tell me what is special about cox1 and cox2 okay we'll come to that so leukotrienes and lipoxins leukotrienes are bad guys lipoxins stop the inflammation they end the inflammation okay so they are released whenever there is damage to the cell membrane with phospholipids getting damaged arachidonic acid is produced by and then it is so it has to be released from the triglyceride or diglyceride where it is being held and then the cyclooxygenase and the lipoxygenase act so you already saw this prostaglandins are also important for pain so cox1 I have it so cox1 is a constitutive and cox2 is inducible so the inducible one is the one which you normally want to prevent you don't want to prevent all cox when you want to give a inhibitor so can you name a cyclooxygenase inhibitor have you done it in pharmacology 
somebody is telling something kya bola aspirin so what about a cox 2 inhibitor so some of you are telling so specific inhibitors have more specific action and less of side effects so they prevent things like bronchoconstriction they cause pain to go away without uh, causing hyperacidity so numerous advantages are there they also affect clotting a lot less so it is a cox 2 which is inducible which you want so the functions of prostaglandin in general which are d2 e2 and f2 alpha is pain fever vasodilatation and increase so we have come across a new thing fever okay prostaglandin functions if it is thromboxane it's vasoconstriction and platelet aggregation constricting cycling everything is dilatation or diffusing so this is a repetition of what i have already told you these are important for you to remember now we come to lipoxins now lipoxins are anti inflammation so you have a balance between leukotriene production and lipoxin production after the inflammation yeah Run. No, they are not produced simultaneously. They are produced at different locations. So, what produces thromboxane A2? Typically, platelets. So, platelets have the enzyme which is thromboxane A2 synthase, and endothelial cells have the prostacyclin synthase. So, one is trying to attack, the other is trying to defend. So, remember it that way. okay so the enzymes are present at different uh, cells or different places and their function is different so platelets when they activate they want to aggregate platelet are activated when there is damage to the blood vessel so you want to reduce the blood from flowing out you want the blood vessel to constrict and so it causes vasoconstriction and platelet aggregation which will block by forming a uh, hemostatic temporary hemostatic plug whereas blood vessels they don't want to be damaged if they are not right now damaged and somebody is coming and constricting it or trying to form a thrombus on it it will inhibit it from doing that because it is at that moment not damaged right and so it will defend itself by using prostacyclin synthase so lipoxins end inflammation and they are produced when after some time of leukotriene production it starts producing lipoxins they inhibit leukocyte recruitment inhibit chemotaxis inhibit adhesion and there is an inverse relation of the leukotriene level and the lipoxin so they are important for termination and resolution of inflammation and there are other proteins like resolvin which are also released by you know granulation tissue so cox1 inhibitors are what you normally call as the nsaids and cox2 inhibitors are the uh, things like um, uh, name is escaping my mind although i use it all the time so uh, you also have lipoxygenase inhibitors which will prevent you know asthma you can use a leukotriene receptor blocker but a more general way to inhibit arachidonic acid metabolism is by glucocorticoids which are used a lot in medicine so these down regulate the inflammatory cytokine production by cells and inhibit and decrease the cox2 also and they up regulate lipocortin which reduces arachidonic acid release from membranes so glucocorticoids in addition to inhibiting lymphocyte activity and lymphocyte production in general suppress all the activity of arachidonic acid and it's an important part of why they are anti inflammatory and you use that it's the most potent way that you can kill inflammation 
the other important uh, newly synthesized mediators are the cytokines so what's a cytokine anybody knows why do you call it a cyto and a kine so they are released by cells and they act on other cells and they are mediators so they call it a kine the most important inflammatory cytokines are these tnf interleukin and then typically these tnf alpha and interleukin ones are released by macrophages and endothelial cells and act also on macrophages and endothelial so they do both they are released also there and they act also there in addition to other things they are stimulated by the presence of these bacterial products immune complex physical injury or other cytokines which activate the endothelial cells and once they are released they not only potentiate other macrophages and endothelial cells but they cause this acute phase reactions endothelial cell activation fibroblast activation leukocyte activation all of these they do so they are na given names like this you must have already studied this interleukins and all you have done so interleukins interferons chemokines growth factors tumor necrosis factor colony stimulating factor these are all cytokines and they can act either in an autocrine fashion a paracrine fashion or an endocrine which is in the circulation so typically cytokines generally cause proliferation the more most important func function for a cell is to make more so if it is released it will stimulate say lymphocyte production to go to the marrow and stimulate neutrophil production so that is its most important function the second thing is redundancy so it is not just one mediator a huge number of mediators do the same function so if b cells are to proliferate you get multiple signals interleukin 2 is also there 4 is also there 5 is also there 6 is also there all of them can simulate a b cell to uh, proliferate the other important thing is that cytokines can be divided into pro inflammatory and anti inflammatory pro inflammatory are those like il1 il6 you must have read about il6 because it was in in covid tnf alpha then interferon then acute phase reactants this is the other pro inflammatory uh, cytokines interleukin 1 and tnf alpha so by default you can always say il1 tnf alpha il1 tnf alpha and il6 as the extremely potent pro inflammatory cytokine then inhibitory or anti inflammatory cytokines are typically il4 and paradoxically il6 so il6 comes at the end initially it causes more inflammation but in other methods or if macrophage 1 or macrophage 2 gets stimulated can serve different functions so interleukin 10 is another important anti inflammatory so almost always you can say that the il8 and il12 are the pro inflammatory and or pro you know effective against say tuberculosis and il10 is the one which inhibits the inflammation so more il10 means tuberculosis grows more or inflammation is more or rather damage is more anti inflammatory so il1 and tnf alpha are the main ones in the vascular endothelium they activate it the so production of leukocyte adhesion molecules production of chemokines pro coagulant in the leukocyte they again activate it and cause production of other cytokines in fibroblasts they cause proliferation so that means healing which we'll do in the next chapter or one of the lectures then they have the systemic effects which again we come across this fever the leukocytosis that means that there is release of neutrophils from the marrow so what is happening inflammation is happening what inflammation needs neutrophils if it needs neutrophils it has to come from somewhere that somewhere is bone marrow 
then it causes these acute phase proteins to increase it reduces appetite so if you have a fever you generally don't feel very hungry and in certain fevers you sleep a lot so these are the systemic manifestations of inflammation almost all of this is caused by tnf and ilf il1 il1 and tnf alpha so what are these acute phase reactions so these are called acute phase reactions there is fever you know it increased slow wave sleep there are there is rem sleep and there is slow wave sleep so there is more of this slow wave sleep if you ever had a high fever you might find that you have intermittent sleep in which you feel little delirious also peculiar thoughts are coming so your rem sleep is also disrupted there is a loss of appetite you don't feel like eating lots of neutrophils come into the circulation so what happens to tlc tlc will rise so if your normal range is 4 to 11000 here it will be 20000 and all of them are coming from the bone marrow initially there are lots of release of band forms which are almost mature neutrophils they come out and subsequently more neutrophils are produced by stimulation so the me ratio increases the myeloid to erythroid ratio becomes higher because more neutrophils start getting produced there is proliferation because of release of various colony stimulating factors which are also produced by the same endothelial cells and macrophages then it causes this corticotropin and corticosteroid release which are stress mitigating hormones or hormones which deal with stress increase in levels of certain proteins which are called acute phase reactants too much of this acute phase reaction causes shock which you will study in a subsequent chapter and they can also cause mobilization of body fat and body protein get a cachexia so people become thin he had a one month of typhoid and he comes out thin you might have seen or you might have heard now we come to what are acute phase reactants so these are the things which react in an acute phase these are proteins which are increased during inflammation so this include this serum amyloid which you must have already done it's an acute phase reactant it also has a function it is chemotactic c reactive protein increased and it's important as an opsonin so you use this a lot to check whether there is inflammation in the body or not alpha 1 antitrypsin this uh, serine protease inhibitor inhibits antitrypsin it's an antitrypsin i mean inhibits trypsin mannose binding protein which you as you know is an opsonin and can activate the complement haptoglobulin which binds hemoglobin ceruloplasmin which is an antioxidant and binds copper fibrinogen which causes coagulation and other clotting factors are also acute phase reactants alpha 2 macroglobulin which is another anti protease similar to alpha 1 anti trypsin and another cysteine protease inhibitor so all of these are called acute phase reactants so there is release of pyrogens in the circulation these pyrogens mostly it means il1 and tnf alpha only this pyrogen resets the hypothalamus causing a higher temperature until the reset hypothalamus comes back to normal so body responses which increase heat loss are vasodilatation sweating lethargy and sleep a lot whereas when you are rising your temperature you have chills you have vasoconstriction in skin so you feel cold you are mounting a fever you feel cold increased basal metabolic rate increased heart rate and you tend to curl up the body now the last of the groups is chemokines which are chemoattractant for leukose uh, leukocytes and there are multiple classes of chemokines what you can remember that although there are 40 of them only some are important you can remember this as alpha chemokine which is interleukin 8 which is for neutrophil chemotaxis beta chemokines are mostly macrophage activation or uh, attractants you also have eotaxin and rantis gamma chemokine which is lymphotactin and cx3 chemokines which are fractal kind which are all important for lymphocyte chemotaxis
Chemokines are basically chemotactic cytokines. Okay. Uh, platelet activating factor is another important uh, factor which is derived from phospholipids, which causes platelet aggregation, vasoconstriction, and bronchoconstriction. Derived from platelets and functions is stimulate more platelets. Also, it does all the functions of inflammation which you can think of. You can just rattle it off. Nitric oxide. Again, just like uh, you have two enzymes, you have two enzymes here. One is a constitutive, one is the inducible. The constitutive is the endothelial and the neuronal. And the inducible is the one which is present in macrophages, which is important in inflammation. So, inducible ionos releases NO, which causes vasodilatation. And vasodilatation is a pro-inflammatory effect. More NO release ends inflammation. Why? Causing platelet aggregation and inhibition of mast cells. So, this is just a graphic representation of the same. So, nitric oxide is also important in killing of microbes or microbicidal. Other mediators are lysosomal constituents, which are hydrolases, free radicals, which cause you have read free radicals, they cause damage. So, they also damage in inflammation. And neuropeptide substance P and neurokinin, which cause pain. So, I have given you a very long list. What you need to remember is these. So, whenever anybody asks you a question, you should remember at least three. When you are 20, you should remember three. You will also, the person asking the question will also remember three only. But you have to know three and not tell the wrong three. So, vasodilatation important are histamine, anaphylatoxins, C3A, C5A, and prostaglandin. Increased permeability, histamine, anaphylatoxins, and leukotriene C4D4E4. Chemotaxis, C5A, leukosine, leukotriene B4, and chemokines. Acute phase reaction, IL1, TNF alpha, prostaglandins. Pain, prostaglandins, bradykinin, substance P. Tissue damage, lysosomal enzyme, free radicals, nitric oxide. So you should remember these almost everything in inflammation is summarized in these two slides. Inflammation ends because these mediators have a short half-life. Wash away of mediators happens and stop signals of which there are three important ones. Lipoxins, transforming growth factor beta or beta. What about the alpha? TGF alpha is fibrogenic, causes inflammation. But TGF beta causes end of inflammation and nitric oxide. The outcome of inflammation is either a complete resolution or healing by fibrosis or it can progress to chronic inflammation, all of which you will do. So, you can do certain diagnosis. So, suppose somebody says I am inflamed, somewhere I am inflamed. How will you do find out? You will do a CRP or you will do an ESR. If they are increased, you will say somewhere inflammation is going on. So, all of these can happen. Either it heals or it becomes chronic or you get an abscess. So, why do we do all this inflammation and study all this? The injurious agent is removed. Necrotic tissue is lysed and carried away. Normal tissue regenerates. If normal tissue cannot regenerate, then fibrosis occurs. The signs of inflammation disappear and area becomes normal. Now, we missed out, since you all came 10 minutes late, we missed out on a few things which I was supposed to tell in the last lecture. But before that, any questions? Do you understand chemical mediators? Anything you want to ask or know? Yeah. So, always the damage is causing some release. So, where do free radicals typically produce damage? Can you suggest? Free radical damage damages three main components. What are those three main components? Everything in the cell. Cell has three components. What are those? Cell membrane damaged. What happens when free radical damages cell membrane? Lipid peroxidation. So basically, you cut. So there are two tails in a free fatty acid, cuts the double bond, 
they get cross linked and so it curls up so that membrane is damaged and what happens if membrane is damaged as far as inflammation is concerned arachidonic acid gets stimulated and it gets formed and it starts inflaming then it cut the second thing which free radicals do is cross links all the proteins sulfoate bonds are cut and so they all form not cut they are created rather you can say so double bonds or bonds which cross link all the proteins if they are cross link all the proteins what is likely to happen because of that you have already had a class on that it comes in cell injury so you get what is called er stress so endoplasmic reticulum is stressed by free radicals and this endoplasmic stress in turn can have subsequent downstream effects both at the cell membrane level and at the nuclear level at the nu if the cell is still alive the nucleus will release various transactivating factors or it might be some chemokine or something is produced Yeah, exactly. I don't also remember. Then it damages the nucleus. Free radicals can damage nucleus, and if nucleus is damaged, what happens? Typically, p53 gets activated, and the cell stops, you know, growing or dividing further until the damage is repaired. In addition, nuclear damage also causes activation of apoptosomes. which are uh, sensors which determine whether the cell is going to live or die so er stress um what do you call this uh, necroptosis these two processes are interlinked and these in turn can stimulate inflammation by generally causing damage to cell membrane there was something inside so one of the pathogen associated molecular patterns can also be produced by release of damaged proteins so just like you have normal structure of, so almost all proteins in inside the cytoplasm are antigenic if they are outside and they are also patterns which can be recognized that is another area where inflammation can be stimulated whenever a necrotic cell is bursting so as long as blood is still flowing there will be response any other questions so let us quickly go over certain diseases caused by leukocyte defects you have taken the attendance no wait at what time you took the attendance ha ah, jo late aaye उनका गया चलो तो नाउ दैट दोज हु केम अर्ली आर फीलिंग हैप्पी आई विल कीप यू फॉर फाइव मोर मिनट्स तो लेट्स गो क्विकली यू कैन गेट अ ग्लूकोसाइट अधिशन डिफिशिएंसी तो डिफरेंट थिंग्स व्हिच स्टिक कैन बी डिफिशिएंट सो इंटीग्रिन में बी डिफिशिएंट एलएफए1 डिफिशिएंसी सीएलआई लूप Glucosyl transferase, an enzyme which produces CLL Lewis X, can be deficient. You can get a phagolysosome formation defect, which is Stadia Higashi, which is you get giant lysosomes which fail to transfer enzymes to the phagosome. Or you can get microbicidal defect or the NBT test, which indicates that there is an NADPH or a chronic granulomatosis. NADPH oxidase is deficiency. So here some details of led 1 and 2 are given now there is a third type also what do patients present with various types of wound healing is poor recurrent bacterial infections sometimes you can get immune deficiency and bleeding all this can happen if the leukocytes don't adhere these are certain examples you are getting recurrent uh, inflammation of gums mostly all of these phagocyte you will get bad teeth as the main function then you have chronic granulomatous disease is an important disease which is detected by the nitroblue tetrazoleum test or a dihydrorhodamine which is now done in 
uh, flow through analysis which test whether the cells have the ability to produce oxidation or not so if you look at this everything comes from the nadph oxidase it's only subsequent to that that the superoxide dismutase and the mpo can have some effect so if this is gone you have serious disease if this is gone nothing happens because it's not that important the primary is this so Myeloperoxidase deficiency is very common but not uh, causing any disease. Yes? So, in chronic granulomatous disease, you have a defect in the NADPH oxidase and there are multiple types, X-linked or autosomal decisive, because there are multiple components which constitute the NADPH oxidase. And you get recurrent infection by catalase positive organisms. Have you done catalase in your bacteriology? So certain things like cephalocosis produce catalase. Catalase destroys the H2O2. So already the H2O2 is less. Whatever is there, catalase is finishing it means we can't kill that microorganism. Again, more of teeth and gum infections, abscesses, uh, impetigo. Okay. So another in, important thing which you can um, remember is this Viscott Aldrich syndrome. So here there is a trafficking defect of antigen presenting cells. So homing receptors are abnormal. So patients present with recurrent infections, eczema and thrombocytopenia. But the important thing to realize that the homing receptors which we discussed in the previous lecture are not there. Then you have this Chediac Higashi syndrome, which is an autosomal recessive genetic defect in which phagolysosome are not formed. And so you get recurrent persistent infections, albinism, platelet dysfunction, and you get this giant uh, lysosomal inclusion. So the lysosomes in the neutrophil are huge. So if you look at a peripheral smear, you find neutrophils which are very big, which are very big granules. giant granules. So that's it about the inflammation. Thank you all very much. And uh, we will conclude. You can take a short break. And after that, your next lecture will come. As the next lecturer arrived, it's from our department, right? Who is there? Has he come? So you can request him to come. Until then, any questions are welcome. Do you have back-to-back -back lectures in uh, anatomy or physiology? Yes. Uh, 9 to 10, 10 to 11, like that. Uh, Dr. Adesh Age? He carry a Age. Hi. You got the activity record, sir? Yes, sir. I have the record. Yes, sir.